Welcome back uh, to all of you in the room. Uh, we are uh, now uh, right before our uh, third keynote uh, 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 on the second day already. So we have a good high density of, of keynotes here. Uh, and but this uh, and with with every keynote, we intended to bring in some uh, some unique perspective on open science, right? And, uh, this one especially uh, we thought of as complementing uh, the, main pro uh, the main program of submissions to the conference. Since mostly what we've heard up, to, up until now was um, various contributions uh, uh, on how open science impacts uh, our lives as researchers, as research practitioners, um, and the re research flows that we apply uh, in our own work. Uh, but we also know that, uh, that open science um, relates to as relevant to the whole uh, uh, scholarly communication chain, and that notably, uh, notably uh, includes the journals. We also heard a lot uh, about the incentive structures that uh, that put certain pressures uh, uh, on researchers to do certain things at the expense of others. And yes, also again, a lot of these incentives uh, point towards uh, uh, the journals as parts of our uh, scholarly communication ecology, uh, you could say. And this is where our next keynote speaker comes in, who is very much affiliated uh, with one of the uh, most prestigious, if not the most prestigious uh, journal in political science. Uh, I may introduce to you uh, Professor Knoll, Thomas Koenig, uh, from the University of Mannheim, who is the uh, head editor uh, of uh, the American Political Science Review, who will share with, uh, with us today uh, his thoughts, reflections on uh, open science from what I have just confirmed, predominantly his uh, his role as a as a journal editor. He's many other things besides that as well, but uh, he will emphasize that aspect of his uh, professional uh, being. So welcome uh, to to Professor Koenig. We're glad to have you here. Uh, and yeah, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this kind uh, presentation. Um, and see, perhaps uh, I'm. Um, Putting it a little bit on um, quote here, uh, whether we are already uh, have arrived uh, um, in a more transparent uh, scientific world. Um, perhaps for those who are not political scientists, the American Political Science Review is an associational journal. And I emphasize this because uh, there are um, more or less um, rising tensions between the associational representation principle of all the subcommittees and caucuses and people who engage in the American Political Science Association on the one hand, and then on the other hand, this uh, premier, like APSA calls it, uh, uh, outlet. So uh, to say uh, the journal, we have three journals, but that is the journal more or less the most scientific journal on the, on the other side. And these tensions inherently increase because uh, the rising popularity, or it's not only popularity, the impact of publications in such journals. More or less, in particular in the United States, uh, when you apply for promotion, um, the, an APSR publication, according to all the feedback we have, uh, is the toughest currency, or has become uh, the most important currency for your professional career. The simple reason is you have to convince the dean, right? Uh, and the dean uh, needs to have some whatever criterion to give you tenure, for instance, right? And, and APSR, as the most general, it's not a very specialized, I will show, it's, a, it's the only general journal we have, I think, top journal. The others are more, more specialized, therefore they have a higher impact sometimes, yeah? Uh, so this, however, is more or less a common sense, in particular in the United States, but also growing in Europe. If I look in our uh, search committees, publications, and where they come from, uh, matter a lot. Now, you may say, of course, now, that's good or not, yeah? But the point is that for the editors, on the other hand, we have uh, an increasing number of submissions. So we started with 1,000 per year. Uh, within one year, we had 1,400. Now we have about 1,500 per year. And on the other side, we only have like 4 to 5% publications. So we reject 95% of our submissions about. 
In other words, you do not make too many friends, right? So um, now I will introduce where uh, transparency comes in. And just a side note, there was uh, perhaps something uh, said about the DART initiative uh, some years ago. And a lot of journal editors signed up for that uh, initiative. But when we uh, were elected, it's indeed an election in that case, uh, and, and, and the lead editor is one of the three people in APSA who are elected. And uh, when we were elected, we, we, we had the proposal about more transparency, uh, so to say, uh, reproduction uh, of analysis, et cetera, et cetera. More or less, the whole community stood up. And the whole resistance, when we signed, emerged. When you go to APSA annual conference, more or less, there's an ongoing discussion about that. It was tough. Now, we, were, we are indeed a very anachronic uh, team. So it's a German-British collaboration, which edits the American Political Science Review. So it's really very, very different from what we observe uh, in the world, right? So, um, and today I wanted to, 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 to briefly introduce what we do first. So more or less in where transparency comes on, comes in. First of all, and um, for, from our understanding, we provide transparency so the authors submit the manuscripts. Our main task, I do a couple of things here, but um, I ignore the, 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 the editorial process now. Uh, but our main task is then uh, to find reviewers. And then what we committed to was that we send out all reviews back to the uh, authors. That's one aspect of transparency here. Yeah? That raises a lot of discussion and perhaps also just a, also a side mark. It, it also sometimes shows how difficult it is to provide such transparency because I guess that everybody of you has once in a while submitted a paper and, or have done a review. And in the reviewer's box, you see our oh, comments to authors. But there's also a box comments to, to, to editors. Now, as people know that we send out those reviews, right, <laughs> there seems to be sometimes quite a difference between what the authors receive and what we receive as the editors, right? So you find a lot of polite reviews, right? And then, uh, however, very, no, not nasty, but some whatever uh, comments then which are very critical in the, in the editor's box, right? And, and then we send out those reviews, and then the authors come back and say, like, oh, wow, why, why have I been rejected? You know, there is nothing, you know, I, I cannot, whatever, overcome the criticism, right? So you see, and that's typical for increasing transparency on the one hand, right? More or less provides other channels, activities on the other. That's typical, right? So... When we would even send out that, perhaps we receive then more phone calls or whatsoever. Uh, so it's, it's more or less, this seems to, to, to go on. Furthermore, but what most of the, the, the resistance we're about here is uh, we only conditionally accept papers until authors, accepted authors, have uploaded their materials. Yeah? And, um, and that was the critical issue. Right? That was a lot of, uh, and, but I will also today um, also critically uh, discuss what the people upload. Right? So, and I'm not, it's fine, so we have, uh, we have, indeed, we have implemented this rule, but as I already said, and um, as every lead editorship is elected, it doesn't mean that it will continue. Right? So it, that is indeed was our discretion to implement the rule. Right? Uh, it doesn't mean that the rule will persist. And politically, I'm a little bit uncertain. Yeah? Because, as it shows, the more we push forward, on the one hand, to be more scientific or open science, on the other hand, we find more resistance against it. Yeah? Typical. And uh, unfortunately, as that's my experience, the lead editors receive this criticism. <laughs> so, and have to defend their policy. But it's okay. Now, 
just to give you a brief uh, overview, these are the statistics. So um, more or less, uh, we, we, uh, you see we came in around here, here. So we more and more send out reviews. That shows also the increasing number of articles we receive. So we send out about 2,500 reviews. That's really not an easy task um, because what we want to achieve here is uh, that was our strategy, so more or less um, because of our relatively pluralist publication strategy, the impact factor is going down, our journal. Yeah? And uh, easy statistics, I mean, you will see we, we have a lot of normative uh, materials, for instance, and normative scholars hardly quote each other, for instance. Yeah? Uh, they quote Aristotle or whatever, yeah, but, but, but not the other authors, right? And that, that's a typical phenomenon, right? Why you go down in the, your impact factor. If you only have American politics, for instance, the likelihood of getting quoted is very high. Or if you do a special issue, right, that's all the tricks, how you increase your, your impact factor. You do symposia or special issues. And even then the editor says, look, there is this, this other chapter. Could you refer to this chapter in your chapter or in your article? So you push the impact factor, right? Um, and, and, and that is something which happened in the social science and why some journals have been excluded from it. Yeah? Because it's not uh, credible. Um, so this is the number of uh, uh, manuscripts we, we, we send out. This is more or less per volume. How much is uploaded from the author's side? And I have to, to say that we have no problems to ask accepted authors to upload their papers, right? N nothing. Yeah? Of course, we, we, we have a kind of a, a flexible strategy here. When we, for instance, we set, when, when people say we have sensitive data, um, then we, we, we say, okay, they should send us their prescription of how they generated the code. Yeah? For instance, the Swiss or Swedish uh, official statistical uh, office, right? And then they should also acknowledge or say that they help authors to regenerate the data. Yeah? Because they had committed to these official uh, um, uh, offices then not to distribute the data. Yeah? That's, that's a problem, right? Uh, similarly, that was an argument of a lot of whatever non-quantitative studies that they have an anonymity. It's for us no problem, right? If, if it's a small n or large n, if people can really say like, okay, we can't share the data, then we make a footnote on their article and say like, that is how the data has been generated. Right? We don't exclude other people here, right? So it's flexible in that sense. But you see, however, at the end of the day, we receive relatively um, a lot, and even some people, what you see, some people uh, of former publications uh, then uploaded their data, like Gary King, for instance, right? So he immediately uploaded his uh, analysis. Um, now, as I said, pluralist, what does that mean? It means more or less we cover all fields yeah, in political science. Yeah? Uh, and, and that, uh, but you, you see also, we, we, we have not the method focus here. We have some methods paper, but one requirement is it should be accessible for general political science. Otherwise, we, we, we desk reject it and say, go to political analysis, right? So uh, it's our policy to reach out for the, the, the general readership, rather for the very specialized one. It's in, indeed, it's our strategy, I, I emphasize, because of course you could also argue, oh, we, we publish only whatever special expertise within each subfield. Hmm? So not a general accessibility, but rather a very specific, and that then overall uh, makes up a journal or oh, volume, right? But it's not what our policy is about. So you see that American politics comparative, uh, by the way, uh, from the numbers, uh, it was also surprising to us, uh, but indeed, uh, comparative politics is a major field in, in APSR, not American politics. Uh, American is like IR and uh, uh, what was the second? American uh, at a similar level. Uh, yeah? Um, and, and then we have others IR, low, formal, 
of course, I mean, that is sometimes what people forget. Formal scholars usually use narratives. Yeah? Um, it's, very, <laughs> it's very, unfortunately, because I'm also directing this EITM, uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to publish a paper which has a solid theory and solid empirics. Yeah, that's something, yeah? Yeah, um, that's formal theory, it's mathematical models, right? Uh, game theory, usually, and then normative is, as I said, a lot of things, right? Uh, um, uh, interpretative, uh, uh, yeah, um, all this literature, discussions, um, former uh, ancient theorists like uh, Aristotle or a lot of things like that, but also Asia, we have a lot of uh, recent Asian philosophical articles, so it's, it's philosophy oftentimes, yeah, but not only, right? Um, um, it's, it's, I wouldn't, <laughs> that's also an interesting pheno phenomenon. It's not a straightforward classification, eh? and it's also not exclusive, right? So, because IR and comparative, for instance, oftentimes overlap. Yeah? A lot of studies you can, whatever, classify according to the one or the other category. We leave it up to the authors to do that. Yeah? So, but it's not systematic. As you can imagine, authors understand differently what the one or the other is. Yeah? And sometimes it's not so easy to do that. However, when we run into our annual presentations, uh, we have to deliver always our editorial report there, and then everybody stands up and says, oh, so few, whatever, IR, what's going on in IR? And then we have to explain, you know, what IR is, and that it fits not only into IR, but sometimes also in other categories. Now, the most distinct uh, um, thing is, of course, and, and that, <laughs> that was clear, more or less, I think we are one of the few leading journals which pu still publish other approaches. Yeah? I call it other, because it's really difficult to say what it is. Uh, it comprises uh, interpretative, qualitative, formal, whatever, right? So and if, just if you take formal and, 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 and interpretative, it's not very close. Yeah? So it, it's, it's more a summary category. But we can more easily uh, identify quantitative, right? This is easier. So therefore, I do just this distinction instead of whatever subdivide that into other fields, right? And, but it shows also what, what's going on in this transparency movement, right? And, but I remember by myself as a Mannheim scholar that the quants didn't like to, to upload their data too for a while. It's just a few years ago. And in Mannheim, we have a lot of data graves, you know, of election studies, whatsoever, where no one has access to. Yeah? Because also these people have said, like, ah, I generate, and that's the issue, I generated the data, um, why should I share it? Yeah? And, and that may create some dynamics that people do not, whatever, continue to generate data. And, and it's just free, right? Yeah? But it's not true, because we say, like, you know, it's only published data, more or less, it's published articles, so you have had already the first shot. Yeah? So, in, the, in a sense, you know, and then uh, people here, as you can see, 91% in our period here, two, three years, three years, have uploaded their materials. Now, that seems to, and, oh, by the way, what we also introduced here, two things. First of all, for, for scholars, for I heard this uh, your talk about replication analysis. I come back to that. Uh, we, we introduced a, a new publication format, the so-called letters. It, it has a maximum length of 4,000 words. So, and, and we believe that in the social science, you do not have to always to introduce the whole literature. Yeah? You can all to describe the data yeah, at length or whatever. You can whatever, you can have a result, it's, and, and, and that the result or a contribution, which is small, which is precise, right? And, 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 of, and that it comprises replications. Yeah? Um, that's typical. I mean, I do not have then to go through the literature. It's a study which has been published, 
and then I can re refer to this study, and then I can, as you said, like, of course, in a polite manner, you should always do that. Uh, you should then, whatever, introduce uh, what you have found differently. Yeah? Um, whatever. Now, that's one thing. The second thing, we introduce cross-references. Because um, cross-references will allow qualitative scholars, if they take the burden, um, because most of the texts, meanwhile, are digitalized, to exactly refer to the sources of their arguments, like Aristotle. Right? It's not like more or less a matter of belief or convincing reviewers. That's, that's the critical point, right? So, because then you always produce mainstream uh, perspectives on particular phenomena. And, um, but with cross references, you can, whatever, in detail uh, indicate a word, a half sentence, a paragraph, or whatever where your argument more or less refers to. Yeah? And that may stimulate, the, I would say, the professionality of, of, of this type of research. Yeah? Similarly, I mean, we see it in, in quantitative textual in there. Right? And now, this have, we have done, we hope that in the future, yeah, uh, that will be used. Yeah? Um, but there, are, there is resistance also against that. Now, however, that's all positive, and, and Skip uh, was, he's now uh, leaving, but nevertheless, he was one of these motivators uh, of this initiative, and very important that in political science this has been introduced, and meanwhile, more or less, it's very common in a lot of journals. I wouldn't say in all, but in most. Yeah? However, what we also observe is, and now, I, I would say, like, now, for example, if I'm myself a legislative scholar, if you have legislative data, there is no, there are no anonymity concerns, right? It's official data. It's a, the piece of legislation uh, which has been whatever initiated or something like that. However, people don't upload the reference to identify this piece of legislation. They anonymize the data. And oftentimes, they do not use the full data, but the selection of it. And then they describe it in a footnote, the selection process, the data generation process. And in most of the times, it's my own experience, it's almost impossible to reproduce the data, even though there is no anonymity, like what about personal data? Yeah? So that is a thing, you know, which brings me back to this argument, I have generated the data, why should other people use this data? And of course we find authors which produce, and that's currently a serious concern, multiple articles from one data set. Right? And it's more or less sometimes close. Yeah? And um, in economics there are some scandals uh, where people just have whatever recoded a variable, well, we also had some cases, you know, more or less the same data uh, uh, design. And then, of course, because of the growing importance of publications, it's just publish, 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 right? And uh, it's not what's going on. So this is another concern. Um, so more or less, it's unreplicable. Then second, what we observe is, in political science, at least, we almost have no data analysis, right? And I myself try to do once in a while, it's also impossible because everybody uses another design. Everybody codes his uh, important variables differently. It's, it's not, and it's a little bit like this open science. It's a little bit, we, we, we feel like natural scientists, right? We want to feel like that, but we are not. Yeah? We are soft scientists, right? It's like uh, we have one, one, one study result and we say, like, oh, that is, you know, causal. Yeah? Or, or that is significant, or whatever, right? So I, I'm, since, as an editor, you exchange with editors from natural sciences, right? It's quite different. Yeah? It's a, the number of times you have to reproduce whatever, or rerun an, an experiment in the natural science. <laughs> quite different story. Of course, we don't have the resources yeah? to. Yeah? But we should have this understanding. Yeah? Oftentimes, we publish one-shot studies, yeah? not, you know, and they may change over time and whatever, context, et cetera. So we have almost few, uh, very few meta-analysis, which provide us more solid evidence here, or could provide us. 
Now I come to our own uh, uh, point here. Uh, and that was um, perhaps one remark to the previous presentation about replications. I mean, we are all human beings, yeah? And now we have published a, a study in a major journal which makes up our career, right? And, um, and the editors have, have accepted that, and the reviewers have approved it. And that has been published, yeah? And now some graduate student submits a paper and finds, you know, this prominent person, you know, heirs, yeah? Or whatever, yeah? So, um, of course, in an ideal world, we would say like, okay, yeah, that's good. Now, and, and, and <laughs> science pro is progressing. But what we, we do, instead of now being polite, you should always be polite and whatever, but we have procedures. Now, the editorial procedure typically is to, su to submit the replicated study of his own work to the author, right? So the author is asked, and I saw the answers, right? More or less, we had this one study where Druckmann et al. replicated themselves, so they asked themselves, right? But normally, you ask someone who has made his career to acknowledge he made a mistake, usually, right? Yeah, so, I mean, does this make sense? So we had a lot of discussion within our team about that. And I, I frankly say, we shouldn't send it to the authors. Yeah, because, you know, it, it's not, it's not, it, it's a human being, yeah? We should send it independently then to others, and once this has been accepted, of course the author can go our procedure, and if he has really a, a, a profound argument that that was wrong or not, yeah, et cetera, then he, we can continue this discussion. But editors, and, and, and the problem is, more or less you falsify also your review process. Because the, 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 the review process didn't figure out that this was not rightly done. Yeah? So it, it's, it's difficult. Yeah? And then reviewers may knock on your door and say like, hey, uh, what's going on here? I need to be more cautious because whatsoever. Yeah? Uh, so it's, it's all this implicit dynamics which we have. But, but that is really a thing which I think I, I, I looked at. We have one single replication studies in APSR. Yeah, and, and, and that is due to the procedure, not because they were unpolite or something like that. It's a procedure, yeah? So, and I, I think if we want to have more, more uh, replication analysis, we should change the procedure. Yeah? We should acknowledge that we make errors yeah? as editors, as reviewers, as whatever, authors. Yeah? And then, of course, graduate students can publish yeah? their results. Um, so, in my view, at the end of the day, open science is a kind of a dream, right? It's, 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 it's really, it's, it's, it's nice, we should go in this direction, uh, but it's a never-ending story, right? So it's, it will always have this uh, back and forth, these counter-revolutions, new editors will come in and say like, oh, that was too far, now we change the world, right? And we, 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 we bring it down again and, and uh, whatever, the qualitative and non-quantitative uh, will take it over and, and the association will like it because they have more people uh, pleased and, and all that stuff, all the politics which exist also within science and we talk about professional careers, right? And uh, so, um, but, and I said, when we applied for APSR, no one believed that we can get it. Yeah? It's, just, it's so unbelievable because the journal has been edited since 1906 in the United States. And as I said in the beginning, it's the currency for making careers. It's a currency. When I'm outside of science, I always say like to journalists and others, compared to you, we have a currency, right? We have a real currency, and this is top journal publications. I don't think it's a good currency always, yeah? but it's a currency. Yeah? And uh, so um, what we have done more or less by moving, our slogan was going global, I remember. I mean, it's completely contrary to what we observe. So what we have done more or less, we set the standards for Princeton, for Harvard, recruitment. Right? So they are done here. Yeah? In, in these rooms, right? Because we accept what they submitted in the end of the day. We are, of course, transparent and provide the reviews and everything else. We have to justify our decisions. That's fine. But we are doing this. 
and uh, perhaps once in a while it will be moving to Asia or, or somewhere else. Yeah? I mean, why should such a leading journal be produced or edited within a single region? Yeah? I think every journal should move first. And second, it should not stay for a long time at a particular place yeah? because of these politics. Yeah? So in a sense, the good thing was that we done, we've done it because publications are not yet important as they are in the United States. So perhaps we can a little bit more freely decide <laughs> about these things. Yeah? While in the United States, the, 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 the pressure is enormous. It's good, I mean, you know that, right? So, and this, the political pressure, which also the, the, the uh, editors experience uh, these days, made us a lot of thinking, and uh, it took us a while to decide to continue only one year our editorship, because it's, it's, it's a public good what we provide. We think we provide a public good, but it has become a private good in many eyes, and so that is the thing you know should uh, keep in mind. Um, because we have to find other editors too. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas Koenig, for, for your keynote. There was a lot in there, uh, and I'm sure a lot of thoughts uh, were provoked in, in this room. Uh, uh, we do have a good 15 minutes for, for discussion, so please don't be shy uh, to ask Professor Koenig, uh, whichever uh, question you have, Vernon and then Flavio. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a lot to take in, but uh, one of the things that was sort of emerging as you were talking, I remember an old thesis in sociology written by uh, Richard Harper, who was an accountant who became a sociologist. Um, and I don't very much remember much about the thesis other than there was a clear, a clear evidence in the sort of culture of a of auditing and accounting in these firms, there were sort of three levels. There was sort of an obvious fraud where someone was trying to do something wrong. There was a sort of serious misconduct. So there's sort of red and amber was a sort of serious misconduct where you're an idiot and you did things wrong. And then there was a sort of green level where you kind of just mucked up some, you know, petty cash and and my face. And that was the sort of thing that was kind of seen as routine because people would do this without meaning to really as it were or weren't necessarily incompetent and so on and it's a very the thesis is a very nuanced argument about how auditors then went in to correct these things and how they may even cover them up or expose them or whatever and i'm just wondering to what extent if you had any thoughts on i don't want to go back to gips badges for you know because we might have colors colored badges for fraud next maybe but uh, maybe that's going too far but it, no i just wondered what you thought about the different levels, mm -hmm. potentially, of mm -hmm. um, these sort of areas. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question because we, what, what, I'm an um, institutionalist, right? So, and what we have done so far is, for instance, we have changed the editorial process procedure. Um, like, like, like in faculties, I mean, people apply different criteria to whatever work, right? And uh, you know, I mean, you see it always when we, when I look at our PhD distribution, you can see that people apply different scales. Yeah, so it's a typical, you know, thing. Yeah, and uh, so this uh, and that happens also in 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 in, in journal editors' uh, uh, environments. And uh, there are two models I think which we know from from political science which are applied to govern such a journal. One is the typical what we call portfolio allocation model. So you have a field editor. He has full discretion. And then, you know, it happens, and I'm sitting also in other journals' editorial boards, that you, you wonder, for instance, about the desk rejection rate is whatever at point 0.8 in one field and point 0.2 in the other. Yeah, it, you know, it could happen, but, you know, systematically, you may attribute that to this model, right? And, um, and then I thought about that, and I said, like, I'm, why don't we establish a kind of a bicameral procedure? And that procedure is like, I receive all the manuscripts, unfortunately, and uh, then I have to assign those manuscripts to my field editors. And once they make a decision, in particular, like acceptance or revise and resubmission, that is a critical point, we enter into, if there is critical, if there is controversy, we enter into discussions. If we, are, we remain split, 
in, in, we have another editor, you know, coming in, stepping in. Or we externalize it and have our board members who have more expertise on this particular subject. So, therefore, we, we try to reduce this um, <laughs> which, however, will always exist. There's still differences among uh, field editors. Um, perhaps we have a second component here. We are also always controlled by our uh, association. And not only officially, one is the, the report we deliver every year to the community. The other is they have access to our editorial managing system. And since they have another representation principle, they pay a lot of attention to what we are doing, even though we don't know it. Or we don't get their reports, let's, let, let's call it like that. <laughs> so, so, um, and, and, and that happens, you know, because it has become so important. Yeah? And uh, unfortunately, I say always, why, it's not our fault. The search committees should restart to read paper, right? It's a matter of the search committees. Uh, it's not the matter of the editors. Yeah? And I, as a research mem committee member, I always observe, indeed, people count only. Oh, five articles, right? But once you start to read those, you see like, oh, that's a very tiny research agenda, but published, whatever, five times. Yeah? Um, that's the point, perhaps, right? So, Flavio, you still... You mentioned, I'm interested in measures. Um, you mentioned that, well, some people dichotomize a given variable, another uh, uses the numerical version of it. Um, there are many different scales um, uh, to measure the same thing. So for example, you have ANS and GSS and everybody's measuring ideology and somehow they're using different um, items. Um, I would just like to take, uh, given that your editor of the major or the career-making journal in political science, <laughs> it is true. Uh, how do you look at um, the different findings of the debates that seem to be pervasive, uh, the date all the way back to the 1960s, and we're still ruminating about the same thing, whether people are political sophisticates or not, and we're using the same data, and everybody seemed to arrive at a different conclusion, and maybe, just maybe, that has to do with how we personalize our variables. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, but, you know, um, when people ask me why, why, why I applied for this job, you know, um, I think the simple answer is that the seniors um, are selectively reading, let's call it like that. Yeah? Uh, once you are senior, you know, you become more narrow. And that was like an exogenous shock for me. Right? I, I had to read things which I would never read. So in a sense, that's good. Yeah, I got more ideas. You know, science is getting ideas across fields, not only within your field. That was a good thing. Now coming to yours, um, there are two things. One is a legal thing we have to pay attention to. So, for instance, if I see that these things uh, correlate or have a high similarity, for instance, in a with AJPS simultaneous publications, we had cases like that. Of course, editors have a good understanding among each other, so we exchange. But still, because it has such an impact for careers, if I sue or whatever, initiate our infringement procedure, which is I step in, I go to the department, I inform them about this case, all that stuff. This has enormous implications for the author, yeah? the reputation. Similarly, we have plagiarism calls uh, on 24th I received one yeah like this piece has been published in other things you know you have to stop it it was on our first view loud, like things like that and I said like hey hey people cautious yeah this is a legal thing yeah uh, we, we, we we have a procedure for identifying plagiarism we have a quantitative procedure we have a qualitative procedure and then we take a thing it's a legal thing to call for plagiarism and also you know, to have done it, yeah? because it's a reputational problem. Yeah? And people, what I observe over time is, I, I don't know, I now have three, four years, right? But over time, it seems to that people make such claims uh, 
without much substance, yeah, without legal substance, yeah, and so over time, <sighs> so I, I get I, I have become more cautious, right? Now for the development, I think, however, uh, we have professionalized uh, in in the sense uh, it's it's improving a little, yeah, but. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just to be sure, I didn't mean in any way, shape, or form plagiarism or anything related to bad conduct. I'm, I, I just mean literally for science because EPSR and other high-ranking journals, uh, they are the gatekeeping of what is science and what are yeah. scientific mm. findings. So I'm more concerned as to what is considered science yeah. yep. because we are publishing year in and year out the same on the same data about the same phenomena, except that we're, we're operationalizing it differently. Indeed, you know, that is one thing we wanted to achieve also with this letter format that a lot of in political science people and are credited also for data generation, right? It's just data generation. I know so many colleagues who generate tons of data, but no findings, you know? I mean, it's, it's more or less than, yeah, yeah, a lot of data, but you know, you, in, in our journal, if you want to get published, you need to address some puzzle, some dilemma, some problem, some news, right? And not because of us, yeah? We are the slaves of the reviewers, I would say, in, 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 in a sense that, you know, you have this transparency, we send out the reviews. If I overturn a very criti uh, critical uh, uh, reviewer, he will step down in the future. And we need these people, 2,500 reviews. Uh, we, we need all the people to write qualitatively high, high qualitative uh, uh, reviews. That's, 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 that's the deal with the authors, right? And, and therefore, I think that the discretion on the one hand, what the editors have is limited. On the other hand, I, fully understand, I think I fully understand what you mean is, it's, it's true that because of this process or this system, I don't think that we define science. I don't think that. We define perhaps scientific careers, true. Yeah? But, uh, but science, this, is an, this promotes incremental uh, uh, wisdom, yeah? So almost it's just an incremental procedure. Because it's limited, if you do not quote other people's research, you will hardly survive this process. And, you know, it, it's just a little bit, you know, adding to the current state of the art. I think in other journals, uh, more specialized journals, perhaps you will have more innovative, inno innovation. I know for many famous articles, they have been published outside of the leading journals. Yeah? So that's fine. I'm, I'm, I don't, whatever, would emphasize that we are defining science. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I heard all these uh, Great story said political science uh, journals, meanwhile, rerun the analysis of the authors. Uh, is it really true? No. No. Um, um, that is really a question. Uh, for instance, I can tell you we have a matching fund, uh, so our university and APSA pays half half. And the question is who's paying that? Yeah, so HAPS, for instance, our other leading journal, they have uh, enough resources. To, to invite uh, Olin Institute doing this. So it's a whole institute and it costs a lot of money. And the question is also, is it worthwhile? Um, um, most of the things in PS, PRS, PS, political science research, PSRM, political science research methods, that's the only journal which does it by themselves, but they have a limited number of articles, so 300 per year. Um, but they do it more or less by research assistants. Now, what happens there? On the one hand, I know the numbers, they had whatever, perhaps 5% of replicable uh, articles in, in, in the short run, so the first shot. Then they enter into negotiations with the authors, you know, a lot of time, so, you know, several rounds until this thing has been solidly uh, reproduced. But I would say reproduced. It's not, as I said, it's not replication in the sense that the data generation process is really open 
It's just what you have as tables, what you have as figures. You have a code, and this code reruns these tables or reproduces these tables, right? In my view, that's short, that's okay. It's one advantage or one step forward, but it's not where I wish to be. Yeah? In the first run, if you, if you, if you, according to the editors. Yeah, because you have bugs. You have a lot of, I mean, it's, it's technical things. Uh, a lot of people uh, send in their, their R codes, for instance, right? And, and they do not insert the packages they need to upload. Right? It's very difficult for the editors now to say, ah, oh, what package could it be? Right? So then they go back to the author, say that it didn't work out. Then the authors have to upload in their code these packages. Some people have different versions, software versions, all that problems. Now we have uh, some initiatives which, which more or less put all these versions into a cloud so that the editors could use the overall world, but it's still, let's say, incomplete. So it's very difficult. But the other point is, who is doing this? Uh, it costs about, it would cost us about, an estimation would be 100,000 euros per year to have three people, which we need. And then still the question is, do we only replicate accepted papers? My wish would be resubmitted papers, so invite for resubmission, because it is really the problem. The reviewers should have the evidence, not we or the reader. The reviewers should know whether this is hard stuff or replicable stuff. Yeah? But then we would have to, <laughs> to have many more replications, right? And that is the problem. So um, nowadays we do it randomly and we are happy to say we have uh, only a few exchanges uh, uh, with the authors. Can we have Room for one more question that was uh, asked here. Hi, I'm part of the team at the Odom Institute that supports the AJPS replication policy. And as you described, it is very arduous and very expensive and all of that. Um, so even when you have a policy that just requires data upload, I'm curious about your workflow, if it's affected your manuscript publication workflow, um, if it has just requiring the authors to upload. And then also you ask the question, is it worthwhile? And we wonder that as well, because it is so time consuming. This is my the other archivist who, who deals with that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so what type of evidence would be necessary to justify this kind of policy? What would you what, what would we need to bring to the table to, to say to future editors or, or authors or all the people who might be pushing back on this, what, what would they need to see to convince them that this is yeah. worthwhile? <laughs> uh, we had this initially because uh, we were re very much attacked uh, when we introduced it. And, uh, and I remember I just told this story uh, when I came in, um, there was a Harvard professor and she said like, you know, you discriminate our people, my people from the labor market. Uh, because it's more time consuming, they can't apply for jobs, etc., etc. My answer was, Pretty simple. I said, like, look, your students, you know, they may have done interviews, whatever, in Syria or whatever, with some terrorist organizations, and you know, it's very hot stuff which we would publish, perhaps, right? And then, whatever, a couple of weeks later, it comes out. The Washington Post reports about, you know, they were never in Syria, or they don't speak Arabian, you know, etc. Fake data, all the things which happened already, yeah. Uh, and which are natural if you, on the other side, think that um, it has become so important to publish. So I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that you have so few fake data. Um, and, you know, and, uh, but the, the damage for the discipline would be, or for the journal, would be so high. So uh, because the Washington Post, and as you know from the United States, we have not the highest credibility in, 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 the, in, in, in in, in, in Congress, right, and, uh, and uh, not in, in, in NSF too, so we have a very small research, <laughs> as compared to Germany, we have much more money, relatively speaking, than you have in the United States, because of the low reputation political science has. And it would decrease this uh, scientific reputation again and again, and therefore in order to protect us from uh, such damage, I think it's worthwhile to put more uh, uh, labor uh, and work uh, on, on young people. On the other hand, what we did, I think what was mo much more important for the young people, we introduced in, in APSR first view. 
which didn't exist. So, and therefore, we reduced the, 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 the publication uh, duration significantly because people can then refer to internet publications and the search committees or whatever, the promotion committees, accept that in the meantime. And that has shortened drastically our, our, the time spent for publication. Most of the time which we spend for publication is not up to us. We have statistics on that. It's up to the reviewers. And there is reviewer fatigue. Yeah, of course. I mean, we have a relatively constant number of reviewers compared to the increasing number of submissions. Yeah? And people complain about that and say, like, I don't want to review it, whatever, five times for APSI in one year. That's the reason why we have a kind of a, yeah, a quota system where we only ask people twice per year to review for us. Yeah? But that is the, that's the true problem, to find reviewers you know, giving their work um, uh, to, 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 that the authors, which are mostly rejected, think, oh, it's worthwhile to have submitted to APSR or HAPS because I get feedback for my research. <laughs> That's a natural decision. <laughs>